What you're about to see are the events that led to the Dude Fire Burnover on June 26, 1990. There were six fatalities and five burn injuries. The Dude Fire started on June 25th, north of Payson, Arizona, on the Tonto National Forest. A dry lightning storm started the fire south of the Mogollon Rim. The fire was first sighted at 1315 that afternoon. At 13.30, it was observed from the air to be about five acres. Within an hour, it had grown to 50 acres, and by 1600, initial attack forces reported it to be over 100 acres, with a spot fire about one mile to the east of the main fire. By 1800, a local Type 2 incident management team had taken over responsibility for the fire. Their initial incident action plan called for 30 hotshot crews to be assigned to the fire for the next day. The fire continued to spread so quickly that at 2100, a national Type 1 incident management team was ordered to take over the fire the next day. That team arrived at the Payson Ranger District office at 0430 on June 26th and received a briefing on the fire situation at that time. Brisk down canyon winds had pushed the fire all night, and by 0500, the fire had spread to 1,900 acres. These winds began to subside early that morning. At that time, the fire was actively burning, but the flame lengths were generally less than four feet. The fire was burning through ponderosa pine, manzanita, scrub oak, and needle and leaf litter. There was a moderate loading of heavy dead and down fuel. Fuels in the area were extremely dry with 10-hour fuel moisture content readings of 4 percent, 1,000-hour readings of 8 percent, and live fuel moisture readings averaging 76 percent. The National Weather Service forecast for the Payson area on June 26th was temperature mid-90s, relative humidity 10 to 15 percent. Wind up canyon, up slope, 10 to 20 miles per hour. Additionally, there were building cumulus clouds observed in the fire vicinity before 1000. At 1100, there was an updated weather forecast calling for increased thunderstorm activity. This update was not relayed to fireline personnel, although thunderstorm development was a near daily event on the Mogollon Rim. Reinforcement crews and engines began arriving on the fire during the night of June 25th and the morning of June 26th. However, the total number of crews working on the fire on June 26th was far less than the 30 hotshot crews called for in the plan for the day. One of those reinforcement crews was the Perryville Type 2 hand crew. The Perryville crew arrived at the Payson Ranger District office at 1930 on June 25th. They were given instructions to go to the base camp. En route to the base camp, they were diverted and told to report to the Bonita Creek subdivision on the south side of the fire. Surrounded by national forest lands, the Bonita Creek subdivision is a private inholding of 160 acres, containing about 60 seasonal and year-round residences. The Perryville Type 2 hand crew was managed by the Arizona Department of Lands and was comprised of inmates from the Perryville prison. The crew consisted of 17 inmates, two guards from the prison who served as squad bosses, and one crew representative. The crew representative was a red-carded strike team leader and a regular employee of a nearby fire department. The Arizona Department of Lands hired the crew representative as a temporary emergency employee specifically to work with the Perryville crew on that fire assignment. The crew had been on several fires during that fire season, but this was their first fire with this crew representative. The crew met the minimum training requirements, was outfitted with proper safety equipment, and had two handheld radios. The Perryville crew arrived in the Bonita Creek subdivision at 0100 and was assigned to reduce hazard fuels around the structures. 
About an hour later, the crew was reassigned by the division supervisor to move to the junction of Walkmore Canyon and Control Road 64. This location was about one mile south of the subdivision. They were to build an indirect hand line in preparation for a firing operation that was being planned to protect the structures in the subdivision. At about 0230, the crew began clearing a fire line up a jeep trail in the bottom of Walkmore Canyon. They were directed to build this fire line up Walkmore Canyon to its intersection with a power line right-of-way, and then to build line up that right-of-way to the Bonita Creek subdivision. They completed their hand line up to the subdivision at about 0500. You're looking north up Walkmore Canyon. The subdivision is on the right side of the screen. The Perryville crew spent the rest of the morning continuing to reduce hazard fuels around structures in the subdivision. They took lunch at about 10 hundred. After lunch, the division supervisor from the Type 2 incident management team directed the crew to work their way back down Walkmore Canyon toward Control Road 64. During the morning, their hand line in the canyon had been improved by a dozer. The Perryville crew began limbing ladder fuels along the dozer line about one-half mile down Walkmore Canyon from the subdivision. Further to the south, the Navajo scout crew was also working to improve the dozer line in preparation for the firing operation. Between 1000 and 1100, several hotshot crews moved up Walkmore Canyon past the Navajo scout and Perryville crews. They were hurrying to pick up the firing operation that had just begun to the north of the subdivision. The crews exchanged brief greetings, but did not exchange any operational information. At 1200, a transition meeting was held with the Type 1 and Type 2 operations section chiefs. The Type 1 operations chief later expressed discomfort with the transition, since there was only a short period of time available to interact with the Type 2 team. He also felt that the Type 1 division supervisors had not made a good transition with their Type 2 counterparts. After this meeting, the Type 1 operations chief made division assignments for the new Type 1 division supervisors. The division supervisor that was assigned to Walkmore Canyon later stated that he was unsure of his area of responsibility due to the lack of maps. He knew there were three hotshot crews assigned to his division, but was unaware that there was a Navajo scout crew and a Perryville crew in his division. Between 1300 and 1400, several of the hotshot crew superintendents above the Perryville crew noticed that the winds became calm and they experienced slight drops of rain. Because of these weather changes, they were concerned about dangerous fire behavior. They discussed these concerns and reaffirmed their escape routes. The Navajo scout and Perryville crews did not receive any of this radio traffic due to uncertainty of whose division they were in and incompatibility of their radio frequencies with the other crews. By 1315, the firing operation around the subdivision to the north had been suspended due to increased fire behavior and difficulty in holding the line. During this same time period, the operations chief and the district fire management officer were in Walkmore Canyon. In the vicinity of the Perryville crew, they observed that the fire was 200 to 300 yards from the crew and about one-third the way down from the ridge to the west. These two individuals reached the control road at 1415. At about 1330, the fire behavior analyst in base camp noted that the convection column had become well-developed and an ice cap had formed on top. This was not noticed by any line overhead or by the air attack flying in the area. A spot fire was reported south of the control road at 1345. At about that same time, a member of the Type 2 incident management team still at the Bonita Creek subdivision attempted to leave the area. He found the route blocked by fire. Two dozers then began to improve a safety zone in the northwest corner of the subdivision. This would become the safety zone for several hotshot crews and strike teams of engines. 
Sometime around 1400, the convection column began to collapse, creating strong downburst winds over the fire. These downbursts caused the fire to change from a surface fire to a crown fire, moving a mile and a half in 30 minutes. Well, yesterday we were ordered to go up this cat line up here, and um, we did. We walked about, oh, about a mile up that way, and uh, we were working up in there, and this, this was not like this then. The, main, the fire was further on up. There was a ridge up there. It was on top of that ridge when we were working in here. So about 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon, uh, we met up with the Paraville crew from Phoenix. And uh, we worked with them for about 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, the, whip, the, the wind changed on us. It shifted towards us. It was working down this way, but it shifted to the east. So we realized that, you know, there was something wrong. So everybody on my, my crew, they started running. We started running back down this way. And um, it was something that, you know, it was unbelievable. I'd never been in a situation like this before. And uh, that fire just came right after us and we some guys made it faster than others, and a few of them started falling behind. And we did, I did what I could to push them, to get us to get out. We threw our tools down, and we, we got out. And the Paraville crew was still behind us when we, when we got out here. And I, I don't know what happened then. We just, there were some vehicles here. We just bailed into any vehicle we could find. We got out of here. The entire Navajo scout crew and nine members of the Perryville crew escaped out to the control road. Where the fire first crossed the dozer line, it split the Perryville crew. The remaining 11 members of the Perryville crew turned to the north, up the dozer line in Walkmore Canyon. They started running back up the line with the orders to get their shelters out. One crew member, near the rear, stopped to take his pack off to get his fire shelter. The fire then crossed the dozer line above him and cut him off from the rest of the crew. He deployed his fire shelter at this location. He was uninjured. The remaining ten members of the crew continued up Walkmore Canyon, trying to remove their shelters on the run. All crew members had their shelters on their web belts, mounted vertically under their packs, they were unable to remove their shelters on the run without removing their packs first. They ran up Walkmore Canyon, carrying all their tools, chainsaws, and other equipment. As the crew representative reached a steep portion of the dozer line, he gave the order to deploy their shelters. The crew members began to deploy their shelters. Several were successful, but others were unable to fully deploy and get under their shelters before the flame front reached them. Four crew members died at this site. One of the crew members who had successfully deployed panicked during the passage of the flaming front, yelling, I can't take it anymore. He got out of his shelter, stumbled over several other crew members' shelters, then ran downhill and died about 150 feet below where he originally deployed. Another crew member got out of his shelter immediately after the flame front passed, while there was still a high level of radiant heat. He walked towards the control road, where he laid down and died after several minutes from severe damage to his respiratory system. Items discarded by the Perryville crew, such as the fire shelter polyvinyl bags, canteens, and goggles on hard hats, showed little or no signs of heat damage, since they were on the ground when the flaming front passed. All of the crew members who properly deployed their shelters and remained under them during the periods of intense heat survived with burn injuries. Brian Tagaback of the Navajo Scout crew offered his impressions of the experience. And all I remember was uh, black heat, blazing death, one way out, you can't quit, life or death, don't stop running, safety is around the next bend. And that's, that's all you thought about, was just running, not stopping, and if 
she stopped, she could die. And you just kept thinking that safety was around the next bend. You have just seen the events that occurred on the Dude Fire. The instructor will now facilitate a discussion about the use of fire safety guidelines by the involved personnel, the strategic and tactical decisions that were made, and the human factors that contributed to this burnover incident.